we own the city and we should never forget it. We the people, the city would not exist without people. But uh, yesterday, on the sustainable city, yesterday I addressed uh, the question of the environmental issues and I do not want to repeat that today. Basically, to put it very brutally, without nuance, the space of policy, which is the dominant space when we're trying to address the question of the environment, is not enough. Even if we implemented all the policies we have now. And the graphs are very, very striking in that sense. We would just make a little bit of difference, but it would still be on the curve of destruction. So my basic approach is we need to make every surface in a city work. Work with the environment. And that means bringing in the knowledge of scientists, material science, biologists, etc. And there is an extraordinary amount of work being done on that front in many universities around the world. And I'm always amazed to what extent the discussion of policy keeps all of that stuff out. So I, again, I'm not going to talk about that. I am going to talk about what is written on that slide, which is two critical issues for cities, which are part of the sustainable city discourse. Um, so, and, um, and I have to be very short, I've written at length about this, but there we go. So one, one first point I would like to make is that when we say city, we say much more than a dense built environment. Historically, cities have been spaces where those without power get to make a history, where those with power get to make some extraordinary innovations that get tested against the complexities of the city. The city is much more than a dense residential arrangement. An office park, very dense, is not a city. Huge mega projects that sort of eat up little streets, you know, urban tissue, that, does, that may add density, but it does not add urbanity. It actually can de-urbanize the city. So I'm sort of putting all my cards on the table. I'm a bit of a radical thinker in that sense, you know, a bit on the edge, the extreme. But I think we need that wall even the most urban conditions are somewhere in the middle, a much more sort of vaguer zone. In, but we need that strong wall against which to talk in order to see how urgent it is to protect that thing that we call city, which is one of the few complex conditions that across millennia has outlived far more powerful but closed systems. So you get the picture. That for me is a larger landscape. Now what I'm talking about now is something that I'm doing actually for with Joan Kloss for Habitat since you brought him, him up. And so here are these two critical issues. You've already read it. And I think these are uh, developments that threaten what I would like to call cityness, uh, and that it's not simply. So this is a familiar subject, I'm sure for many of you. I'm not going to dwell too much. This is the best data set, land matrix. Uh, the data have by now been also <coughs> updated a bit, but it, we're always behind the times. Uh, after 2006, really starting very strongly in 2008, uh, with the crisis sort of reaching its maximum point and being recognized, you see a vast amount of uh, buying of land. Uh, in 2006, when the crisis is beginning to happen, uh, uh, but it's not a publicly recognized, a acknowledged event. For a while there, for six months, and I just put this on the table not as a critique, but as an indicator of a larger history. The main buyers of land in sub-Saharan Africa, in Russia, and in Ukraine were hedge funds and financial firms. Not because they were going to become farmers, but because land became one of the ways to hold your money, to invest your money, etc. Today, we can add urban land to that. So, and now, this story in itself, the land grab story, ur urban land grab story, as it is often referred to for, by shorthand, matters also because the people 
who were living in that land that is bought by large investors. It's about 15 countries and 100 plus firms that have dominated this market in the, you know, since 2006, really. Um, but of course, you know, what happens when you do develop a plantation, two things. One is you expel lots of people, you expel faunas, floras, industrial sort of rural industry, rural economies. And just to look at the urban side of this, you know, the hidden urban side, well, where do those people go? They go to cities. Cities are becoming one of the last places where people without anything can go. Cities are extraordinarily complex but extraordinarily open systems. And so that feeds a bit also the, the urban slum zone, of course. And, and um, I should say that, that once they arrive in the slums, there is a kind of erasure of their knowledge of what they knew about climate, these farmers, not rural. They knew about a lot of stuff, and we just see them. They're flattened into urban slum dwellers. We should actually use their knowledge to develop, you know, a kind of urban agriculture if you want. But this is there is a bit of a of a tragic story. But the main concern is that from the perspective of cities, sort of in the longer term, is that this mode of agriculture plantation kills the land because lots of fertilizers, lots of pesticides, and sort of erasure of all the complexities of land that was there before. So what we're going to be seeing is more and more need for accessing other land, which means more and more rural populations being expelled. So the story from the perspective of the city will have to account for the fact that we will have more and more people coming to cities, not because of the old logic city lights, you know, a better, no, because they're being expelled. Add to that desertification and the fact that much land is now underwater and you get the picture. And here is sort of another, I think, a very interesting point, which is that most of the land, you know, insofar as we know about it, uh, and these are only acquisitions, by the way, over 200 hectares. If they are smaller than that, they're not counted. Most of that land is used for biofuels, which means that they can use much more pesticide, much more fertilizer than they could if it were for food. In other words, quicker destruction of that land. Land will not survive that kind of treatment. <coughs> now, uh, so here I just have that, that short spin. You can just read it very quick. No crop rotation is a critical element in that. I'm just going to move on. Um, now, the other intersecting variable, if you look at the planet and the environment, not just at cities, it's that much land is getting hotter. And hot land means land that is dying. And so here you have the temperatures, you know, of, and it just keeps growing. This is the result. These are aggregated uh, graphs that are based on multiple different scientists, different scientific efforts of different measures, but they all go in the same direction. And this is what we have. This is where this is just one variable, water, where it's already limiting agricultural productivity, and that includes the United States, including what it so proudly calls the breadbasket and so modestly of the world. That land is getting hotter. So much high-quality fertilizer. The surface is still green and beautiful green but it is dying. So when we speak about cities, we do have to, and since cities have people, <laughs> we do need to bring in this broader landscape if you want. Now, there is a new wrinkle in the making. This is a fairly recent story. And, um, and by the way, I should just, just to my, my question, who owns the city? There are two different answers. The first one is people own the city. Hence, those people who are expelled from land should be able to make a claim, which, mind you, in certain regimes, remember in, in Moscow the Limichnik thing that you couldn't, or now in China, Chinese, you can't just go from the rural areas and access city. So this is sort of a transversal story also in the making, which is the notion, who has a claim on urban land you know, and on the city? The city is a more complex category. Now, this is the latest development. I'm doing a big research project on this, working with legal scholars also. Who can buy 
land in the city. The data set is 100 cities that are right now the top recipients of investment, both national and foreign. How do you buy urban land? Well, you buy it via buildings, mostly. The data that I will show, minimum investment is five million, so we are not talking nice little homes or apartment buildings, we're talking corporate investments. And, um, and it's both, na there's national and foreign, and I show you differences, but I think that the critical variable is not whether it is foreign or national. The critical variable is that it is corporate. It will produce huge buildings. And again, as I said at the beginning, mega projects, they might uh, add density, but they may be de-urbanizing the city. And again, for me, it's very important to think, this is a footnote again, that density is not enough to mark a city. That is the most typical measure. If it's dense, it's a city. That's a very serious mistake that has consequences. An office park is very dense, but it's not a city. It's a privately owned, controlled, etc. operation. Those without power do not get to make history in an office park. I can assure you that, right? They have to leave. And when I say sort of a, a concrete example of those who get to make a history, uh, you know, that a city is a place where those without power get to make a history, is the immigrant communities. They make an economy, a modest economy, a culture, uh, you know, and, and, and that is something that matters a lot. It has historically mattered enormously to all our big cities. Now, let me show you some of the data here. And again, I have a hundred cities. I, these are just the top. This is annual money, okay? 50 million in, in New York between 20, middle 2013, middle 2014. Now, um, uh, London is number two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This excludes what is called site development when you develop a home new site. So, for instance, in the case of of New York, a major investor. It happens to be a big Chinese corporation, construction company. But the fact that it's Chinese to me is completely secondary. I just want to emphasize that. I really don't think that that is the issue. But they bought a huge patch of land called Atlantic Yards, I don't know, which right now has manufacturing, logistics, transport, but also artists, of course, have moved in because it's underutilized space and, and all kinds of sort of homes. Well, they're going to evict all of that and build 14 huge apartment towers private, privatizable thing. That is a very significant difference. You know, it may upgrade the quality and it may sort of uh, raise the density and make it look more urban. But it has eliminated one of those sets of conditions that has enabled cities to have such long lives. So I think that these are very important issues. Now, if you look at foreign, okay, I'm sorry. So the, you know what, what happens is that there are a few cities at the top, and then it dribbles to a certain level. It goes on for 100 cities. Clearly, there's no room to show all of that. And then here's foreign investment, where London, as we know, is the major recipient. Now, many people say, well, you know, this is gentrification, which is a standard term that we have all probably heard, right, before, but basically, the richer move in and upgrade, and the poorer have to move out. And where they go, who knows? I think that gentrification is not enough to capture the particularity of this development. Um, so just to give you an example, in London, some of you probably know this, the Qatari royals now own more of London than the Queen of England. You know, that's not gentrification. When you're talking with two incredibly rich royal houses, we're talking about something else. And I just mentioned that not because I think it's cute. I don't know that it's cute. It's sort of, wow. But it sort of marks a difference. Eh? So it's sort of in, the, in that spirit. Now, again, the fact that it is foreign, but here you have the foreign. You can see that London receives from all over. There, there, there are ethnographies that are incredibly interesting about all of this. Um, 
one story in London some of you may have heard is a complaint that um, that the streets are empty in rich neighborhoods, right? Because they're, it really is storing m money. Now, a lot of these cities, a hundred, are in the global north, as we say. But there are also a growing number that are in the global south. And I think that, that um, uh, one of the issues that we're seeing when you look at cities <coughs> is geographies of centrality that I, I call these geographies of centrality, I hope the term communicates something, that are very partial, but cut across traditional divides, east, west, north, south. Luanda has now become part, capital of Angola, has now become part of Lagos already. So what I want to, to emphasize here is that a, a dynamic that has a lot of global south cities as well. They are not the main recipients of capital. They are on that list. But so back to my, my example. So Luanda is now part of that geography of centrality. It is one massive construction site, building, building, building. Luanda has very rich, Angola has very rich elites, enormous national wealth, you know, mining stuff, and, uh, and a very poor population. Luanda is completely privileged, uh, and and so you know for the elites in Angola this is great stuff. This is deeply problematic stuff. I don't know if people understand. So what you have are these dualizations that are happening inside national territory, and they are of a new kind. These dualizations have always existed, but these are of a different kind. Now. Um, if I have a bit of time, I just wanted to look at some micro-histories that are also happening. In this case, the global north is exhibit number one, but the global south is a rapidly ascendant exhibit number two, and we see it in the case of Rio most visibly. It's on television all the time. All the various populations are being evicted from Rio to build the new luxury hotel they need for the Olympics, etc. This is a very peculiar history that I want to show here. But these are, one, my way of, see, of, of putting it, these are all, as I said, micro-histories that are happening. They are a bit invisible. They lack the drama of, you know, the, of some of these other developments. But they tell a tale. And they tell a tale that even as we keep saying most people, and it's a fact, most people in the world live in cities or are about to be living in cities. There are also many people who are in deep trouble and basically being thrown out of the cities where they are in. Now there are a lot of other cities, you know, these are often the most, sort of the most famous cities if you want. But I think that there are multiple layers of history that are being constructed uh, that are still often invisible and that complicate the story. It's not a simple story. But we've got to deal with it. And among these histories in the making are a bunch of power vectors that we're going to have to deal with if we really want cities to be the way you were describing them. You know, it's great to have housing for all, etc. I just, I, I happen to be a very critical scholar and I'm also looking at that larger map that one wishes didn't exist. Now here, very quickly, I'm not going to, to dwell too much on this, but this was something that came out of the financial sector, an instrument that had nothing to do with providing housing. The usual term is a subprime mortgage, but you know, that really, but it is a very dangerous, it's now declared illegal in the US, but it has entered Europe, and it's about to enter um, India and, and, uh, and China. And so the result, and again, this is not about housing, and this is not about people having a misconception as to whether they could have housing. This is an instrument basically meant sign, sign this contract. Uh, and as I said, it has been declared illegal now in the United States by the Obama administration. 500 contracts needed to be signed every week for each agent involved. Just sign the contract. Yes, you can buy. You don't have to pay anything for the next five years, for the next seven years. Uh, according to the central bank in the United States, 14 million plus such contracts were signed in a period of about seven years. 
15 contracts, households, 15 million households, 14 million households, that's a lot of people. They basically have now a role in process of eviction. This is annual, this is not cumulative. There you have the figures, the data come from the central bank. I'm using a descriptive mode that comes from another entity. And the last now we're getting there, here is the curve. You know, it begins to dribble, but the five year. Europe thinks it doesn't have that problem. Europe has that problem, including nice countries like Denmark and Netherlands. <laughs> there is Denmark, that's the low. Uh, now, uh, Hungary is the worst affected, a million households out, that's a lot of households. Remember, a household can have one person, four people. Um, Germany high, most Germans are not aware that this is happening, most Germans rent actually. So those annual figures, 91,000, 87,000, I have the full table in my, for all European countries in my book. Uh, so these are all histories. Now, if this is happening in Europe, a civilized space, you know, if this hits India and China with massive populations, with rising middle class, etc., you know, these to me are dynamics that an entity like Habitat also needs to take into account. Um, now, the outcome of a lot of this, of course, is urban land, uh, is empty urban land. <coughs> and that then gets you back to the whole question of um, of corporate investments, right? So there are separate trends, you know, they have different genealogies of meaning, different origins, but there is a kind of outcome that happens here. But even, and that is why this language of more and more people live in cities, it is so general that it is this fantasy that, you know, but there are serious evictions happening. Well, many of those people wind up being really ruralized, so to speak, but Rural land is also empty. And again, for me, the critical image that I want to leave, sort of a foundational element. What is the city? And the city has historically been this complex but incomplete space where those without power get to make a history, a culture, an economy. Thank you very much.